nonprofit ooh, recording. Um, AAEW is a nationwide nonprofit organization celebrating 140 years dedicated to advancing gender equity for women and girls through research, education, and advocacy. Mount Vernon AAUW was founded in 1956 and is one of 11 branches in Northern Virginia. There are a thousand branches across the country. In the past year, AAUW produced four research reports, trained 188,000 plus people to negotiate their salaries through Start Smart and Work Smart programs and the free Work Smart Online course. Granted, nearly 5 million to 260 grantees and fellows to pursue academic work and to lead community projects to empower women and girls. We advocate with Virginia AAUW on two state priorities, which are paid sick leave, part of the Family Act, and as part of the eliminating the gender pay gap, we seek to ban the salary history. On the local level, we have a book group, game night, dining out, and other activities. We work hard, but we also have fun. Solveig Eggers, our program vice president, will tell you a little bit more about today. So Solveig, where are you? Where'd she go? <laughs> She's there. <laughs> She's I'm here. I'm here, I'm here. Oh, I'm there so you are, here. right, yeah. <laughs> So, um, welcome to our author talk today featuring Lisa Grunberg, author, uh, the, the uh, author of um, her memoir, My City of Dreams. Uh, Lisa will talk for about 20 to 25 minutes in conjunction with a slideshow and as, as Janelle said, followed by question and answer period. Um, we are very grateful to Joanna Crane, AAUW member Joanna Crane, for making us aware of Lisa and of her research and her, her marvelous book. Um, Joanna and Lisa went to high school together and um, they lost touch. And then Joanna found Lisa or encountered Lisa on Facebook and they renewed their friendship. So um, I'm gonna turn this over now to Joanna who will introduce uh, Lisa, our speaker. Thanks, Solveig. Um... I'm Joanna, and I'm so delighted to be able to introduce Lisa Gruenberg, who is the author of My City of Dreams. Lisa is a physician and also an assistant professor uh, at Harvard Medical School. She is a graduate of Williams College. I received her medical degree from Albany Medical College and her MFA from Lesley University and she has received many academic awards and advanced certificates as well. In 2004, Lisa's father, Harry Gruenberg, a Viennese Holocaust survivor, began having nightmares and flashbacks about his past, and in particular about his sister, Mia, who had disappeared into Germany in 1941 at the age of 15. When Lisa was awakened in the middle of the night by Mia's voice, she felt compelled to write down Mia's words. This became the genesis of My City of Dreams and Lisa's journey as a writer. After her father's death in 2005, Lisa traveled to Vienna, Austria, Germany, and also back to her childhood home in Syracuse, New York, to trace the fates of Mia and her father's extended family and friends and neighbors. Uh, My City of Dreams was the result of this amazing work. Um, it was published in 2019. It is available in hardcover from Amazon, also on Kindle and Audible, and will shortly be available in paperback. And Fairfax County Public Library also has some uh, copies in circulation. In addition to My City, Lisa's essays have been published in several literary magazines, including Plowshare, The Intima, a Journal of Narrative Medicine, and the Michigan Quarterly Review. Her short story set in South Africa, Kaiskama, <clears throat> won the 2012 Massachusetts Cultural Council Artist Fellowship. Lisa is currently working on a young adult novel uh, based on Mia's and her brother's stories and several other works. Lisa has taught creative writing workshops 
at Harvard Medical School, Harvard College, the Asian University for Women and the Karolinska Institute. Uh, she was a keynote speaker at the Medicine and Holocaust Conference in Israel in 2017 and presented My City to the Jewish Book Council at their conferences in May 2019 and 2020. And she has also presented her work in many venues, including the Boston Public Library, the Harvard Center for Bioethics, the CU Anschutz Center for Bioethics and Humanities, and the Holocaust Museum of Los Angeles. So um, we're very privileged to have Lisa here today, and I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Lisa Grunberg. Thank you for that really kind introduction, Joanna. Um, and thank you for reading the book and introducing it to your friends. Um, and thanks you, thank you to the AAUW and the library system down there near Washington for hosting me today. Vienna, Vienna, only you will always be the city of my dreams. In spite of the hardships my family experienced and the times when there was not enough money for food, I feel I had a very happy childhood. And most of all, I was in love with Vienna. That's the joyful beginning to my father, Harry Gruenberg's memoir. It's the first and the only chapter. As far as I know, he did not write anymore. He's quoting a famous song from that time. And I think that song really encapsulates how my father felt about Vienna, despite everything that happened there. And although he fled Vienna in 1939, when he was 18 years old, he spoke about his childhood always with great joy. It's only now that I realize his joyful stories uh, continued through the hard year after the Anschluss, the annexation of Austria to Germany in March of 1939. It, the same joy was there through his escape from Vienna to England, his eventual incar uh, incarceration by the British and the Canadians who were afraid of spies and even beyond. He would be separated from his younger brother for close to 35 years. Um, his sister disappeared into Germany in 41 when she was 15 years old. After the war, he would marry my mother who wasn't Jewish. He would discover his parents were murdered. He didn't know exactly how. He thought maybe at Auschwitz initially. And so many from my father's large extended family would be murdered or would simply disappear. Um, and I noticed when I started writing the book that when I thought about the stories my father told me, his family, his parents and siblings particularly simply disappeared from his narratives. And he just spins the yarn of a sort of a plucky hero on a solitary journey of luck and adventure. My own memoir also starts with this line from the song and my father's quote about Vienna. And at the beginning of the book, I'm middle-aged, my father's in his 80s, and he's suffering from Parkinson's. And it's at this point that that perception, perception changed. My father began to have flashbacks, mostly when I was in the room, and he began to have this recurring nightmare about being buried alive. And it's only later that I realized that that nightmare was based on information that was released in the 1990s by Austria describing the fate of the deportations from Vienna from 41 to 42, including the deportation of his parents. I'm gonna read briefly from the first chapter. Um, we're in our weekend home in New Hampshire. Uh, I'm a gynecologist, my husband's a lawyer, he's away. Uh, my older daughter, Heather, is home from boarding school. She's grown a little distant. Lydia, our youngest, is 13, is having medical problems and will soon develop a crushing depression. My dad and mom are visiting. They're in their 80s. 
my father retired as a professor at Syracuse University in 1987, and he was spending a lot of time working on genealogy research. My mother uh, feels the past should stay in the past. We're watching a movie that triggers a memory my father had of a lamp he made in shop when he was in high school in Vienna. I wasn't really listening as always, and I go into the kitchen to start making dinner. And Heather is doing her homework here. I didn't hear my father join us in the kitchen until he spoke. I made a lamp like the one in the movie, as well as a metal paperweight with an Art Nouveau design. I nodded at its faint reflection in the window. When the brown shirts came to our door, they told us to leave. They took the lamp and the paperweight. My mind struggled with my father's unemotional voice, the scene he was describing and getting dinner ready. I replied with the first thing that came into my head. Were they polite, I asked. My question hung in the air for a moment, giving me time to consider its absurdity. An animal growl emanated from my father. It made me spin around to face him and I knocked a plate off the counter and it shattered on the floor. Heather started up from her work and looked down at the broken plate and then from me to my father. The serene man we knew was gone. He looked terrified. Were they polite? Were they polite? They were not polite. The quaver that usually held my father's voice captive had evaporated. It was Kristallnacht. Heat rushed my face as he went on speaking fast and loud. They banged on our door and when Muti opened it, they pushed her aside. It was as if he was in the middle of a scene that only he could see. The local policeman was their leader, a man we saw almost every day. The rest were members of the fascist youth wearing dark shirts and carrying clubs. My father moved out from behind the counter and stood next to me. He seemed to tower over me. His speech accelerated further. They took our keys and pushed, pushed us out the door and we fled. Where did you go? I shouted back at him, even though we were just interested apart. He didn't answer me, but stepped back, then mumbled and groaned. He spoke a stream of words in German. I couldn't understand him, although he said Muti again. I tried to put my hand on him, but his arms windmilled. His eyes strained wide. He seemed to be looking through me to something far beyond. But just as suddenly, he focused on me and shrank back into his familiar, stooped form. His voice was quiet, but steady. When we returned, the doors were open. The same with our Jewish neighbors, the Meltzers and the Harbans. Everything was smashed and thrown across the rooms. What little we had of value had been taken, including my lamp, the paperweight, and a suitcase with clothes we were sending on to Uri in Palestine. A few marks from my, my sister had hidden were also taken. He held the counter as he staggered to the kitchen table. He struggled to drag a chair out and lowered himself into it. Then he flipped through Heather's math book. Heather looked at me. I indicated the text with a nod of my head. Heather slid her notebook in front of him. He studied her solution, then leafed through her textbook. How would you solve this one, he asked, pointing it at one of the challenge questions. He had told me that Heather emailed math problems to him from Exeter, and they corresponded back and forth, debating various solutions. I don't think they talked about any of their day-to-day -day activities or exchanged thoughts on anything other than math or physics. He took a paper napkin, his stationery of choice when he wanted to play, explain something to me when I was Heather's age. Then he pulled a ballpoint pen out of his shirt pocket and clicked it three times. It circled over the paper before lighting and his unsteady numbers slanted down the page. Let's try another approach, he said. Yours is good. I just want to show you a different way to come at it. The broken plate crunched under my claws when I walked to my father's side and put my hands on his shoulder. He reached up and patted me. I felt his familiar tremor. My mother was reading the front page in the living room when I left them. Lydia had flipped onto her stomach and her arm hung down toward the floor. Did you hear that? I asked my mother. Hear what? Dad, did you hear him in there? No, she folded the newspaper in half, then quarters. 
he was talking about Kristallnacht. Was he in Vienna on Kristallnacht? My mother thought for a minute. What year was that, she asked. I don't know, mom, but did he ever talk to you about still being there? He seems to be talking about the whole thing a lot now. Maybe it's that new medication he's on. She put the paper aside. He used to sit across from me for hours and not say a word. Forget about actually having a conversation. Then he went off to that room of his and closed the door. But now he's talking again. You can't get him to stop. But mom, this isn't dad running on with one of his old stories. He was speaking German. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. What did he say when he was speaking German? I don't know. I think it was something about his mother and his sister. I don't know enough German to follow him. And he was talking pretty fast. Does he ever speak German with you? She picked up the paper again and unfolded it. Never. Well, not since he tried to teach me when we were courting. All I know is that he gets started on one of those old stories and you just can't turn him off. And this stuff comes up in the most inappropriate times with the wrong people. No one needs to hear these things now. It has nothing to do with them. My mother started up on her puzzle again. What would be the appropriate time, mom? Who are the right people? My mother sighed and didn't look up. What's past is past. You can't do anything about it. Lydia turned again, but didn't wake up. I went back to the kitchen. My father stooped over the dustpan, sweeping fragments of the plate into it with a whisk. Heather must have gone upstairs. The potatoes waited in the sink. Are you okay, Dad? Sure, why not? I opened the cabinet under the sink and my father emptied the dustbin into the garbage. He cleared his throat and looked out the window. Let's hope the weather gets better tomorrow, he said. I started peeling again. When was Crystal not dead? In the window's reflection, my father's head barely came to my shoulder. 1938, November. So you were still in Vienna then? Yes, I was unable to leave until March of 39. Why do you ask? Because you were just talking about it. I was? You were. My father unfolded a towel and pulled a plate out of the dish rack. Yes, they came to the house and told us to leave. So we left. Ori had already gone to Palestine. Fortunately, my father wasn't home. There was a lot of men that day, my father swallowed. What else do you remember? I asked. That's all I remember about that, he answered. I wondered if that was true or if he were somehow protecting me. He opened the silverware drawer and pulled out knives and forks. I'll set the table, he said, and turned his back. So there were several fl flashbacks after that, but after a really horrific flashback where he described a woman pulling up her skirt and urinating on a Jew who had been beaten and was lying on the street with a crowd around them cheering, I decided I needed to videotape my father. And during several days of videotaping him, I finally asked about his sister because I sensed she was sort of at the center of all this distress. So when I was growing up, my father rarely talked about his sister, but if he did, he didn't use her name. Uh, he uh, called her my sister, and mostly he called her Lisa, which is my name, and sometimes occasionally called her Maya, which I thought was how you pronounced her name. Um, and that's my cousin's name. Um, and he often talked about how we resembled each other. He couldn't tell any specific stories about her, but he would say she was <coughs> smart, she was funny, she had a good sense of humor. And it's interesting that um, if you look at his family and my family, it, we were also two boys, two older boys and a daughter spaced almost exactly the same. So sometime during the middle, 
uh, the videotapes, I said, just tell me some anecdote about Maya, um, some story. And he looked at me and he began to cry, um, or at least tears started falling. And I said, I can't remember. I simply can't remember anything about her. And then he said, um, and Mia was quite a young lady when I left. And that's when I first heard her real name. That was how it was really pronounced. And it was at this point I, I began to wonder, did my father really love me? Or did I simply occupy this void that Mia had left in his heart? Now, as you know, I'm a physician. I don't believe in the supernatural. Um, but at the time I was suffering from depression and insomnia. And after that revelation, I feel like she woke me up and she spoke to me. And I wrote down her words and she presents the mystery of her disappearance. Did she go to Magdeburg as my father believed? He thought she went to a camp there. Did she go on from there to Theresienstadt? That's what some other document says. Well, she gassed at Auschwitz. That's what some relatives thought. Was she forced into prostitution? Did she somehow return to Vienna to be deported with her parents in 1942? And after my father's death, I had dozens of family letters translated and it became very clear what a close family they were and really how close my father and his sister were. And eventually I journeyed to Vienna and Germany to trace her fate and the fate of family, neighbors and friends. And I wove my own story with Mia's, my father's outbursts, his writing and genealogy research. I wove them with primary source archival documents, photographs, family letters and memoirs and those joyful tales he told me long ago. I tell Mia's story in her voice the book is part detective story paralleled with my present day story of, of um, my own life, of the search for Mia and everyone. But a close friend read it and told me she thought it was a love story. And I think that's really true. I started this, this book thinking that there was a void at the center of my father's love. And I ended with an understanding that that void was just filled with yearning, a yearning for connection and for those people he had lost. It was also a search for the source of the own, the emptiness within my own soul. And it was a search for my father's love, which I have found I misplaced. Now, throughout the book, I use these letters, diary, primary source documents, and photographs to make a collage. So the book is visual as well as a written story. And for this, I have to thank Ty Poole and particularly the talent and imagination of Ingrid Mack, uh, their designer, who put the book together. I'm going to briefly share some slides and then we'll open it up to question and answer. So that's the book and that's a uh, Ingrid Mack took a, a postcard uh, that we found online from the 1930s sent from Vienna and that's the Praetor with the Reisenrad, the uh, Ferris wheel um, that figures in the story. Uh, that's my parents about the time of my father's first outburst. This is my father's family. So my father on the far right, 
uh, Uri, his brother on the far left, and Mia in the center, and my grandparents, Leo and Elka. This is my family, which I think you can see really echoes his own. That's me at 16. And I put that there simply because in my research, I found a photograph of children who were in a Jewish school, the Youth Aliyah School in the center of Vienna um, in the 1940s. Um, and there's a young woman uh, here uh, who I could not identify, identified a number of people in this photograph uh, based on some survivors that I met. Um, for some reason, the slides are not advancing. Let me try again. But I think there is a quite a remarkable resemblance there. Of course, by the time I collected this photograph, my father was no longer alive. And just the, there are a number of remarkable documents that just very coldly um, uh, establish what happened to people. This is, I have multiple habitation records from the police uh, in Vienna uh, from their central archives. Um, this is the card for Mia. Um, however, my father doubted she was on this transport in 42 because there was no transfer court on April 27th. Uh, this shows, this is a document I found that shows Mia on a list of young girls who were sent to Magdeburg Pro province in 1941. Uh, to harvest the asparagus. This is a damning document. This is just, it's dated May 27th, 1942, the day my grandparents were deported from Vienna and it lists their belongings, um, a table, a chair, 75 marks, um, a few other belongings. It's kind of like a receipt as if they would come back and retrieve these items. And you can see my grandparents' signatures at the bottom of it. And I think that's, that's enough. I have, I have hundreds of photographs, but. So I think open it up to questions. <laughs> 